Well, because of the length of this narrative, I'm not going to ask you, as is our tradition here, to stand and read it aloud together. But as always, um, the text will be on the screen for you to follow along. As we rejoin the action this morning, Paul and Aristarchus and Luke, along with the Roman centurion Julius, his soldiers, his prisoners, the crew of the ship, uh, had been on the island of Malta for three months after shipwrecking there in a violent storm on the Mediterranean. You remember when they had set out for what should have been a three-hour tour, the weather started getting rough, the cargo ship was tossed. If not for the sovereign hand of God, their lives would all be lost. The ship was wrecked on the rocks of an unknown island island that they discovered after the shipwreck was the island of Malta. And again, we, we saw the sovereign hand of God in having deposited them exactly where he wanted them, only 50 miles off the southern shore of Italy, which had been their original destination all along. And so they, though they had not navigated their way to Malta, they had been blown by the storm, out of control of the ship. Uh, God had put them right where they needed to be. We actually don't know a great deal about what took place over those three months, except that uh, many were healed of various sicknesses, beginning with the father of the Protos, the chief man on the island, probably a, an appointed Roman governor. And by the time, time they departed, it's clear that they had also gained a significant favor from the islanders who had hosted them. And in between, we can only assume that Paul was doing what he always did everywhere he went. He was proclaiming the kingdom of God. He was teaching people about Jesus. So let's pick it up then at verse 11 of Acts chapter 28, their approach and their arrival. After three months, we set sail in a ship that had wintered uh, in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin gods as a figurehead, putting in at Syracuse. We stayed there for three days. And from there, we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Puteoli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. Notice at verse 11 that they again boarded another grain ship, also built in Alexandria, Egypt, probably very much like, if not identical to, the one on which they were shipwrecked three months earlier. And uh, for some reason, Luke includes this little authenticating cultural detail that the ship's figurehead featured the twin gods. Twin gods would have been Castor and Pollux, who in Greco-Roman mythology were the sons of Jupiter or Zeus and who were considered the patrons of seafarers. Well, let's take a look at at the map to see where they went. You see the island of Malta there south of Sicily in the Mediterranean. Uh, They set out from there. They went up to Sicily, the southern southeastern, almost the southeastern tip of Sicily at Syracuse, not Syracuse, New York, but Syracuse, Sicily. And from there up to Regium, which is on the the toe of the boot of Italy. We all learned about the boot of Italy in our geography courses, right? And uh, though the, the red line obscures it and the black dot there, there is a passageway between Sicily and the mainland, and that's where they would have passed through the straits there. Um, Kind of a a, a difficult place to navigate, I understand, but they made it through. And then uh, they made it up to Puteoli uh, in record time. So Malta to Syracuse, Syracuse to Regium, Regium to Puteoli. Sounds like something you'd order at a restaurant, doesn't it? Oh, it's a little of that putioli. There are three really wonderful things that, that happened on this journey. And the first is that when they came to putioli, for reasons Luke doesn't explain, they had a seven-day layover. Um, maybe that Julius, the centurion, had business there. But the significant thing that Luke tells us is that they found Christians there in putioli who invited Paul and company to stay with them. And and Julius, the Roman centurion who had custody of Paul, allowed him to accept their invitation. Now think with me about this. Remember, don't forget, 
that, that Paul was a prisoner of Rome. And it is a tribute, I think, to the genuine respect that Julius had for Paul uh, that he granted that permission. We could probably assume that a soldier accompanied Paul everywhere he went. Um, Julius would have been completely within his rights to have said no. And yet Paul was able to enjoy the hospitality of brothers and sisters in Christ, just as he had done in Sidon at the very start of the journey to Rome, uh, just after they had set out from Caesarea. And this also tells us that Christianity had already made it to Putioli. And here's a reminder that the advance of the gospel was, was not just on Paul's shoulders alone, was it? At the start of the series, we thought together about the fact that the Acts of the Apostles might have been better titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. And it would be easy for us to think that the hero of Acts is either Peter or Paul, but we would be wrong. The hero of this book is God himself, who by his spirit powerfully advanced the gospel throughout the known world and beyond. And here's one of the most important takeaways from this series, that God has infinitely greater, infinitely more intense passion for the expansion of his kingdom on earth than any of the prophets, any of the apostles, or any of the greatest evangelists and missionaries in history. God has greater passion that the person you prayed for moments ago would come to know him than you could ever muster. The mission of the gospel rises above any one individual or any one group of individuals. You see, God really, ultimately, didn't need Paul. But he chose Paul. He doesn't ultimately need you. He doesn't ultimately need me. And yet by his grace and according to his purpose, he invites people of every nation, every race, every language, every color or hue of skin to participate with him in what he is about in this world. You and I today are granted the amazing opportunity to join God as his ambassadors in advancing his kingdom. And we should never take that calling lightly. It is an incredible privilege. We should never overlook any appropriate opportunity to make Christ known to those who have never heard the life-transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you're conscious of the fact that all around us here in Thurston County are people who have never heard even the simplest beginnings of the message of the gospel. They've never heard so much as Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They've just never heard it. And oftentimes we think, well, they've heard it, they've rejected it, they've rejected it, they're hostile toward it. In most cases, people have never heard the message of the gospel, even people who have been raised in churches, never heard the gospel. From Putioli, The journey took them by land to where they joined the Appian Way, a 132-mile-long avenue that Richard Longenecker described as the oldest, straightest, and most perfectly made of all the Roman roads. There, You can still see the Appian Way today. Many portions of it are still visible. I read that uh, as it entered the ancient city of Rome, it's now 26 feet below the level of modern Rome. That's that's a lot of sediment. (laughs) But it's long, it's straight, and it was a great road. In verse 11, Luke says, and by the way, throw that map up there again, would you, Cindy? You see where, you see Putioli up there in the far left, and, and then that's where they would have gone inland and, and, caught the Appian Way, and and that would have taken them straight into Rome. In verse 11, Luke says, And so we came 
to Rome. So we came to Rome. And this is when the second really wonderful thing happened. Picking it up at the middle of verse 14. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier guarded, with the soldier who guarded him. So the Christians in Rome heard that Paul and his friends were coming. And they sent out a delegation to meet them, to welcome them. But here's what's amazing about this story. They didn't just wait at the gates of the city. Like they, they didn't put the big ribbon, you know, across the gate and the big ceremonial scissors to cut the ribbon, give them the key to the city. It wasn't that. Luke mentions two places on the Appian Way where groups of Roman believers met them. One was the Forum of Appius, and then another place called Three Taverns, which is the average small Washington city, right? Why is it important to know where these meetings took place, where these groups of people met Paul and his delegate, his his uh, entourage? It's this. The Forum of Appius was 43 miles south of Rome. Three Taverns was 30 miles south of Rome. And so these believers from Rome walked those distances to meet Paul, to welcome him in a manner in which an emperor or a conquering hero would have been welcomed in those days. It's similar, in fact, to the the crowds joyfully welcoming Jesus at his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. And I wonder if Priscilla and Aquila were among those who came out to greet Paul. Do you remember them? That's been a long ways back in Acts. Significant people in Paul's life. We know that they had relocated to Rome. And in fact, in Romans 16, as Paul begins to wrap up his letter to the Romans, he he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila for me. He's writing to a church he's never seen. He's writing to people he did not know. But he knew Priscilla and Aquila were there and were part of that church. So he said, greet Priscilla and Aquila for me, uh, who have who risked their lives for my sake. Significant in his life. Don't miss Luke's comment in the latter part of verse 15. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. It must have been something of an emotional experience for Paul to meet personally this this first wave of residents of the city of which he had always dreamt of visiting. And the first wave of members of the church to which he had addressed that incredible theological and ethical treatise, which we know as Romans, Paul's epistles to the Romans. Paul thanked God and took courage. It became a a, a moment for Paul in which he gave thanks to God for his direction, for his protection, for his guidance, for his hand on his life that had brought him here to this place. And then it also became an occasion in which Paul was greatly encouraged. See, even a leader so great as the Apostle Paul needed the love and he needed the encouragement of other Christians. And it's always kind of awkward for me to address these things, but may I say right here that Christian leaders no matter who they are, need in an urgent and profound way the encouragement and the love of those whom they lead and serve. It's a sad reality today that more men and women who are gifted and called are dropping out of places of significant ministry, most often for reasons of loneliness and discouragement than any other factor. It's happening at epidemic 
proportions. Today's Christian culture exalts those whom we like to think of as Christian celebrities. And far too many of us tend to put those leaders on a pedestal. And far too many leaders pridefully allow us to do that. But those leaders, perched on their pedestals of praise, often have few, if any, brothers and sisters in Christ who are drawing near to them, to encourage them, and to provide loving accountability for their personal walk with God. See, here's the truth. When Satan wants to disrupt a movement of the Spirit of God, he attacks its human leaders. He attacks their marriages. He attacks their families. He attacks their reputations. When he wants to neutralize the life and witness of a local church, he attacks its pastors and its elders and its other significant leaders. Think about this with me. Paul was facing the prospect of an enormous trial in his life, literally and figuratively. He he anticipated that he might soon have a face-to-face encounter with the most powerful man in the known world at the time, the Roman Emperor Nero. And Paul genuinely and urgently needed companionship. He needed encouragement. He needed prayer. And by God's grace, he found those things in the company and the care of God's people there in Rome. See, I want to encourage that, or I want to urge that if you enjoy the leadership of particular men and women, please make a point of encouraging them. Don't idolize them. There's no need to falsely flatter them. That's all bogus. But recognize that, like Paul, those leaders may face significant challenges in their lives that you know nothing about. A word of encouragement, a practical assist in the ministry, an occasional special gesture can can go a long way. Focused prayer for them, for their spouses, for their families can all go a long way in helping any leader to persevere in faithful obedience to God as they fulfill their calling. The third really cool thing that we read about in this passage is what Luke tells us in verse 16. When we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. You might ask, well, is Luke stuttering here? Because in verse 14 he said, and so we came to Rome and Now in verse 16, he is again saying, when we came into Rome. Well, in verse 14, he's probably referring uh, to them arriving in a larger judicial district, like we would think of a county that, that may have been associated with Rome, may in fact have just been called Rome. But in verse 16, he's actually entering into the city. And notice the rest of that verse. Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Paul wasn't thrown into a prison. He wasn't thrown into a dungeon there in Rome. In Latin, this freedom was called custodia militaris or military custody. It seems that Paul was able to rent a house or an apartment during at least those next two years in Rome, all the while manacled by his right wrist to a member of the Praetorian Guard, who during his shift also wore a manacle on his own wrist at the other end of a chain. And his guards would come in and out, undo the manacle, hand it off to the next guy, he would lock himself in. Paul took advantage, no surprise, right, of even that circumstance, 
seeing it as another opportunity to make Christ known. In fact, he wrote to the church in Philippi chapter 1, verse 13, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Isn't that cool? I mean, they are as captive an audience as he is a captive prisoner, right? And so each shift, you know, Paul's preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. Don't you want to come to believe in Christ? In verses 17 to 22, we come to what I just titled defense and desire. Pick it up at verse 17. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And notice with me that the first thing that Paul does after getting settled in Rome is to call together the leaders of the Jews in that city. In Paul's day, historians tell us Rome had 10 synagogues that hosted about 40,000 Jews. A very large Jewish population there in Rome. We've seen this pattern repeated over and over in nearly every city that Paul has visited throughout the years of his public ministry. He, he lived out that principle that he expressed in Romans 1.16, where he wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Notice to the Jew first, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, for the Gentile. If Paul couldn't go to the synagogue, and so he did the next best thing. He called the Jewish leaders and in effect, invited the synagogue to come to him. Now, on this occasion, Paul, it seems, felt compelled to offer an explanation of himself to the Jewish leaders in that city and a clarification of the facts of how he happened to arrive in their city. And, and to summarize, he emphasized three basic points. Number one, he himself had done nothing against the Jewish people or against their ancestral customs, their traditions. Secondly, after he had been arrested and handed over to the Romans and examined by them, the Romans could find nothing against him deserving death and so had wanted to set him free. But third, because the Jews had objected to his release, he felt compelled to appeal to Caesar, although he had nothing against his own people. In short, He had done nothing against the Jews. The Romans had nothing against him. And he had nothing that is no charge, no hard feelings, no bad attitudes against the Jews. So it was in order to clarify those three points that he had asked to see them. He wanted them to understand that he was in every way a faithful Jew. And in fact, it was because of the hope of Israel Israel's messianic expectation now fulfilled in Jesus that he was a prisoner. You know, and there's a point here that that I, I, I just want to call to your attention and emphasize to you. You may recall back in the, the early chapters of Acts that there was a debate going on in the church amongst, um, well, amongst the apostles and, and other influencers over the question, must a Gentile first become a Jew in order to be a genuine Christian? Must that person undergo circumcision? And and must they go through uh, the various rites and rituals in order to become a Jew, in order to be included in Christ? Christ. 
And, and the answer was no, no. And at, at that gathering of leaders of the church that uh, we refer to as the Jerusalem Council, that matter was settled once and for all. But we need to be careful not to do the opposite. That is, you and I need to be careful not to insist that Jewish believers in Jesus live like Gentiles. They're, we would refer to them as fulfilled Jews or Messianic Jews, but they're Jews. And so we ought to allow them to live as Jews as they follow Jesus. You know, I think Paul must have been somewhat surprised when they responded that they had received no letters from Jerusalem about him, that there had been no negative reports about him from um, Jewish brothers that had come to Rome from Jerusalem or Judea. But they wanted to hear his views. They, they wanted to know about this sect of Jesus people that, that Jews everywhere were speaking against. So what do you think? You think Paul might have been inclined to satisfy their curiosity? I think so too. Let's pick it up at verse 23 with discourse and division. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So on that appointed day, it seems that large numbers of Jews came to Paul's lodging all day from morning to the evening. We know that Paul could do that because he preached through an entire night one time, right? Resulting in the death of a young man. <laughs> Remember that story, Eutychus? So from morning to evening, he unfolded to them the character and the coming of God's kingdom. That is the breaking into human history of God's gracious rule, God's rule of grace through Messiah Jesus. And and I wonder, might Paul have drawn a contrast for them between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar? I think he probably did. Secondly, he attempted to persuade them about Jesus out of the scriptures, beginning with the law of Moses, that is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then moving forward into the prophets. How many of you would say today that you could lead someone to Christ from the law of Moses. Not many. And and then I think he must have taken the accumulative witness of the law and the prophets, connected all of those dots between all of that and the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension into heaven of Jesus of Nazareth, including then the subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, on the disciples in Jerusalem on that first day of Pentecost following his ascension. And, and he wanted to identify the biblical Messiah about whom they knew and for whom they hoped and longed with the historical Jesus. This person that you've learned about from childhood, this person you you and your Parents and your grandparents and all of your ancestors have been longing for is Jesus. It's Jesus of Nazareth. And that's where the division occurred. And of course, that's where the division always occurs, isn't it? Luke says that some were convinced, others disbelieved. The gathering that day ended with a bunch of Jews arguing with each other. 
disagreeing with each other. And for those who remained unconvinced, the, the decisive moment came when Paul applied that message of God through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6, 9, and 10. Let me read that for us again. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. It is of great importance, I think, that we understand this prophecy and how Paul was applying it and why Luke included it here at the close of this volume. It would be a mistake for us to draw a surface conclusion that Paul was being simply, uh, being simply rude or retaliating or otherwise reacting inappropriately. So let's briefly examine the prophecy in its original setting and then how Jesus applied it in his teaching, and then finally what it was that Paul was conveying to those Jews in Rome and why. So first let's understand the original prophecy. And I'm going to try to keep this simple. Chapter 6 of Isaiah, in which this prophecy is first found, is both preceded and then followed by examples of faithless, disobedient responses to the word of God on the part of God's people. In the previous chapter, chapter 5 of Isaiah the prophet at verse 24, it's the Jewish people who reject God's word. In chapter 7, it's their king, Ahaz, who refuses to receive the word of God. And that's followed then in the next chapter, chapter Eight, by this statement that God is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. God is hiding his face from the house of Israel. Through the prophets of that generation, God was warning his rebellious people that two essential gifts lay in the sovereign hand of God. First, the declaration of his word, and second, the grace of to repent in, re- in, in response to a reception of the word. As a consequence of their active rejection of his word, their active obedience, disobedience to it over a period of literally centuries, Isaiah's prophecy that the sovereign God was now actively hardening their hearts was a declaration of judgment on them. Don't miss that. These aren't just hard words. It's a declaration of judgment. In fact, their repeated hearing of God's word without understanding, their repeated seeing of the truth without perception would harden their hearts even further. It was as true of them as it is of us that with each act of rejection, with each attitude of resistance, their hearts would become increasingly impenetrable. Jesus then quoted this prophecy of Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 on at least two different occasions It's recorded in all four of the Gospels. In all of the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus referred to this prophecy in connection with that parable of the sower, in which he likened the message of the Gospel to seed, which which a farmer went out to sow. And as he sowed that seed... The seed represented the gospel being sown in four kinds of soil. In only one of those soils does the seed germinate. In only one of those soils does that that germinated seed grow roots and grow up then to maturity. Not so in the other three soils. And those soils represent the condition of one's heart. And we don't always, we, in fact, we, we rarely interpret 
that parable in this way, but it's true that Jesus taught the parable of the sower in order to demonstrate that only a minority of the Jews would receive and respond in faith and obedience to his word. In John's gospel, chapter 12, verses 36 to 43, Jesus quotes first Isaiah 53, 1, and then Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, in connection with the failure of the Jews to respond in faith to the miracles, the miracles that he had performed. Allow me to read this for us, beginning at John 12, verse 36. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Here's Isaiah 53, 1. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then the summary statement, therefore, they could not believe. They See that? They, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, and now here's Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. He has blinded their eyes. Notice that he, that is God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart in turn, and I would heal them. And John goes on and he says, Isaiah said these things, or Jesus is speaking, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. And then John adds, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. Four, now listen to this conclusion, John's conclusion. They loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Moisha Rosen, the founder of Jews for Jesus, once said that the Jewish people are among the most gospel-resistant people in the world. And we have to ask why that is. Why why are those whom the Bible calls God's chosen, his elect, his beloved, so spiritually imperceptive, so spiritually resistant, so blind to the arrival of their own Messiah in the person of Jesus of Nazareth? And a large part of the answer is found right here in Isaiah 6, 9 and 10, that God has intentionally hardened their hearts as an act of judgment. In that preceding chapter, Isaiah chapter 5 at verse 24, God said this through the prophet, their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. In chapters 9 through 11 of Paul's letter to the Romans, I'm not going to, you'll be glad to hear I'm not going to read three chapters to you. But I would encourage you to go home and read if you're curious about this question. Paul, Paul gives a masterful presentation. Uh, of where the Jews are at today. It still applies today. But go with me to the beginning of chapter 11, where Paul again picks up this theme that we're talking about. Chapter 11 of Romans, beginning of verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Remember now, he's, he's, he's writing to, to the church in Rome, which is predominantly Gentile. So he's writing to Gentiles about the Jews. And he says, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. 
But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And then Paul just breaks into this doxology. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So Paul, for three chapters, has been laying out the current condition of the Jewish people and and you'd think, man, he's got this mastered. But but what we realize as he breaks into this doxology and from the words he uses is that his head was exploding too. At, at, at the incredible wisdom, the incredible sovereignty of God. See, here's, here's a message. God is not done with the Jewish people. He has a future for them. It will see its fulfillment, Paul says, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What did Paul mean by that? Well, I believe that in the sovereign plan of God, there will come a day when all of the Gentiles, whom God has appointed for salvation, will have put their faith in Christ. If you don't know Christ as your Savior today, that last Gentile may be you, so would you hurry up and trust in Christ? And I believe that that day, when the last Gentile who has been appointed for salvation puts their faith in Christ, that Jesus will come to rapture the church. Why do I believe that? Because the Bible tells us that what will follow the rapture of the church will be that seven-year period that the Bible calls the tribulation. And if you read Matthew 24 and 25, that's a description of what's going to happen. Description from the mouth of Jesus about what's going to happen during the tribulation period. And, and, and the predominant thing that's happening during the tribulation period, in, in contrast with all the yuckiness that's going to go on, all the pain, all the suffering, is the great turning of the Jews to Jesus as their Messiah. Paul said there in Romans 11, let me read this again, verses 25 to 27, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Man, I hope you'll be here in the fall when we dive into the book of Revelation because we're, we're, we're going to learn a lot more together about God's plan for the end of time and especially his plan for both Jews and Gentiles in the kingdom of heaven. It was as the Jews were leaving Paul's lodgings that day in Rome that he said to them, therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. As we've seen over and over and over again, Paul now again turns his appeal to the Gentiles and says in effect, though you Jews refuse to listen, they will listen. And in listening, they will be saved. But if you have not yet transferred your trust to Jesus as your only hope, your only Savior, please do not fail to heed the warning to you that's contained in Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. Because here's a spiritual principle that each of us has got to understand. Each time you reject the Word of God, each time you resist the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Your heart gets a little bit harder, a little more impenetrable 
a little less likely ever to turn and repent and be saved. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart any further, but hear and understand and surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Allow the oil of his Holy Spirit to to penetrate and soften the hardness of your heart. Today is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. There's a window of opportunity. It's open now and someday will close and it'll be too late for you to receive Christ as your Savior. In a sense, this is a a really fitting conclusion to the book of Acts. As I said, most of the Christians in Rome were Gentiles. And that was something of an indicator of the future of the church, wasn't it? And Luke, Luke has recorded throughout the book of Acts that the gospel will meet a positive response in the most surprising of places and from the most unlikely of people. For example, the gospel saved an Ethiopian eunuch as Philip preached the gospel from Isaiah the prophet. Paul himself could not resist the grace of the gospel. A Gentile Roman centurion received Christ. Lydia, a businesswoman, became a slave of Christ. A slave girl was liberated by Christ. A Philippian jailer melted before the God of the universe. See, the gospel moves in surprising ways. It, it, and draws in people from the most unlikely of backgrounds, even you, even me. And now we come to the last two verses in this almost two years long series. Verses 30 to 31, welcome and witness. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Beautiful, isn't it? There's Paul in rented lodging with an open door to anyone and everyone who showed up, doing what he had been doing every day of his life since that first surprising life-transforming day on the road to Damascus when he came face to face with the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. And Luke ends this amazing volume without actually ending it. And in so doing, he implies that the proclamation of the gospel that began with the apostles in the first century will continue until the fulfillment of the promise of that angel, clear back in Acts 1 verse 11, You remember the disciples standing on that hillside in Galilee with their mouths gaping open, staring into the sky? And the angel said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He's coming on the clouds, and that day is coming soon. Luke's conclusion of Acts leaves us exactly, I think, where the Holy Spirit wants us, right? Ready for the next chapter. It's like coming to the end of a great book and you go, oh, isn't there more? And the answer is yes. And that chapter continues to be written today. The gospel is still advancing to the ends of the earth and God has called his people to participate as his ambassadors in this present chapter. The Bible tells us that the gospel will be preached to every people group. The gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth and then, and then, and then the end will come. There's an implied question then here at the end of chapter 28 that each of us has got to answer. Peter preached the kingdom in Jerusalem and Judea. Philip proclaimed Christ in Samaria. Paul announced Christ around the Roman Empire. 
And here's the question. Where will you go? What will you do? How will you allow God to use you? You see, there is no room in the kingdom of God for any individual Christian to ever say, well, that's somebody else's job. Where will you go? What will you do? When will you open your mouth and proclaim the kingdom of God and tell people about the Lord Jesus? Who's their only savior. You know, many are predicting that the church will soon see its own demise. Don't you believe them? Don't you believe them? I've read the end of the book. Jesus wins. And because he wins, the church, his bride, wins. Our task as his church isn't finished yet. If it was, I think we'd be, we'd be out of here. May God grant us, you and I, Life Point Church, our families, the strength and the courage to stand in that long line of spirit-empowered, faithful witnesses that stretches all the way back to that unlikely band of first century pioneers. Those men and women who filled with God's spirit did indeed turn the world upside down. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing journey that your spirit has taken us on through the this book of the Acts of the Apostles. And Lord, may we be able to answer those questions. Where will you go? What will you do? When will you open your mouth for Christ? May we be able to answer those questions in ways that are honoring to you that are commensurate with our calling in Christ. That bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ and bring hope to those who without Christ are condemned to an eternity separated from you. As we come today to communion, as we gather, as it were, at your table, we come as those who are redeemed, those who you have included in Christ, and those whom you have called to join in the adventure with all its risks, with all its dangers, with all its joys. of reaching the world around us with the message of Jesus. Lord, don't allow us to consign these stories to the ancient past, but allow us by your spirit to live that next chapter so that we would be found faithful when Jesus comes. Lord, as we come now to the bread and the cup, we remember Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In our remembering, call us, Lord, to faithful obedience. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.